We are very pleased to have as our very first virtual speaker ever for the GRAAA, uh, Lauren Woolsey, who is Assistant Professor of Astronomy and Physics at Grand Rapids Community College, where she has been since 2016. And prior to that, she uh, had quite a few interesting things going on. Uh, she uh, had a opportunity to do much of her graduate work at a uh, fairly low profile place out east called Harvard University. And she was a teaching fellow there uh, where she uh, specialized in uh, science of the sun. I think that's where she got kind of this special interest in our nearest star was while doing her graduate work and, ob and obtaining her PhD at Harvard University. One thing I noticed, um, she, she's very modest. She did not send me a lot of bio, but I snooped around a little bit. And in the spring of 2013, she won the Bach Teaching Award at Harvard. Uh, Bart and Priscilla Bach were absolute um, pillars in the research astronomy field for decades. And uh, Bart Bach's name is still familiar to many of us from his many books about the Milky Way. So that's a rather prestigious honor. From 2008 to 2011, Lauren was a research assistant at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And that was while at the University of Maryland, where she was also specializing in studies primarily of the solar system and the dynamics of what goes on there. One thing I noted is a summer inst internship at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory where she concentrated on solar studies, and perhaps that's kind of what launched her on this special interest that we are all about to hear about. Lauren, thank you very much for being the guinea pig tonight. And you are blessed with an audience from all over North America, including Puerto Rico. How about that, Lauren? Perfect, thank you so much, Dave, for that introduction. So I'm going to share my screen um, for the slides. And um, one thing to note, uh, and we said it once before already, um, absolutely please do uh, put into the chat anytime that you have a question, either the question itself, if it's short, or just a note that you have a question, um, and then I can kind of pause and, and let you speak. So, um, as you read in the event um, details, my um, topic today is kind of um, one that I stumbled upon as an interesting idea. And I, I've given this talk uh, once or twice before, but I improve it every time. So you're seeing the very best iteration. Uh, and it's called Unlocking the Sun Spectroscopy in the 1800s. So in this talk, talk. Um, my goal is to uh, go through um, chronologically the things that were happening in this period of time, but sprinkle in science along the way. So this outline is also a timeline of who I'm going to highlight. Certainly there were plenty of people who were working all throughout this time before and after, uh, but we only have so much time um, in, in our uh, session today. So uh, where I'm going to start is right at the beginning of the century um, with William Herschel. So prior to the 1800s, uh, Isaac Newton had um, sent sunlight through a prism and seen the rainbow of colors. And in his mind, that meant that light was composed of all of these different particles of all the different colors that just added together to make white light. He published this in the optics book that was used for 100 years before we finally started to figure out how light worked. But up until about 1800, it was just assumed that that rainbow was all that was coming through in that sunlight. So William Herschel and probably also his sister Caroline, who did a lot of the um, astronomy as well, had set up a... Um, had set up here, you can kind of see the, um, the drawing of, first of all, his, his famous 40-foot uh, telescope in his backyard and him looking very smug. 
Uh, but the idea was he was trying to get a measurement of the temperature of all of these various um, colors. And so he's got um, thermometers set up and he, he identified that there were in fact different temperatures associated with the colors. But what he also found um, was that in the extended portion beyond the red, he was getting even more um, readings. He was getting higher temperatures beyond red. And it was the first real kind of identification of light that is not of the kind we can see. So the entire spectrum of types of light, so the electromagnetic spectrum, spans all possible frequencies and all possible wavelengths. And I'm sure at some point we've all seen a graph like this, but I do want to go through some, some key ideas here. First of all, on the, on the left side of this particular page, when we've chosen to put the shortest wavelengths and highest frequencies on the left here, we have gamma rays. And gamma rays were identified through um, radioactive decay and other um, atomic processes that were happening. There was alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles. Eventually, we figured out that the gamma ones were just photons. They were light. And that term extends for everything as, as short wavelength as we can possibly theoretically make um, to a certain point where we start to then call things x-rays. And there are, in fact, wavelengths where those two um, uh, definitions overlap. Now, gamma rays and X-rays are both very thankfully for us blocked by Earth's atmosphere. And so we can't measure them when we're on the ground, which means that all of these um, scientists in the 1800s, they're not gonna learn anything about those, um, that part of the spectrum. Then we have ultraviolet right next to violet. We go through the whole rainbow and we get to infrared, which was what Herschel had um, found and identified. And so the sun produces the peak amount of light in roughly the green color. It looks yellow to us because the red and the green, uh, the red and the blue kind of balance out unless you have haze from wildfires and then it looks very red. But in general, we would call it a yellow star and it produces plenty of visible light and it also produces ultraviolet and infrared. Beyond, um, at longer wavelengths, we've got microwave, radio waves, and uh, one of the two types of light that makes it fully through Earth's uh, atmosphere is ra radio waves. And so that's how we send signals to spacecraft and hear back from them. And radio, again, in that same kind of way, by definition, extends to the longest possible wavelengths we could theoretically make. So right at the start of the century, we'd begun this process of understanding that there's more here than meets the eye, quite literally. With two years later, we start to get kind of written um, and published results from not just seeing that there's a rainbow, but being able to break it up into a uh, wide enough range and visibly see that it's not a perfect smooth rainbow. There's dark lines missing from that spectrum. And so William Hyde Wollaston in 1802 was the first one to notice or at least publish that sunlight has dark lines in it. He noted seven distinct lines that he could see in his particular setup based on um, the very uh, thickest dark lines were the ones that he would have been able to identify and he labeled them with letters. So although he was first, he's often not the one credited with all of this, um, but he was the first person to see what we now know are absorption lines in the spectrum. So everyone's kind of figuring this out in the 1800s, but with these absorption lines, we are identifying certain wavelengths that are missing from the spectrum. Now this slide is here because we do wanna right away make sure we understand the different types of spectra. If we have a hot object that is um, glowing in visible light, if it's a solid object that is simply glowing because it's hot, like the embers of a fire um, or a, um, a blacksmith's um, poker, it will produce a smooth rainbow of colors. 
It will peak at a certain point based on how hot it is, um, but it will produce everything. The problem is, is if that light then goes through much lower density gas, like the outer layers of the sun, and then also the atmosphere of the earth, the electrons in that gas can jump from one energy level to another and take away those photons. And I like to tell my students in class that all of those electrons, um, they, they're lazy, they like to just sit on the couch and do nothing. And so you have to give them energy, but the right kind of energy. They aren't gonna hold on to it for very long. So what we see here in the bottom right of the um, chart here is that the same exact wavelengths that that particular gas is taking as the electrons jump up off the couch, they realize they wanna uh, go back down to those lower levels. And so they emit it and they give off those exact same set of wavelengths. For any particular atom, we actually get a very specific pattern of these lines based on how much energy it takes to get to the various places where, they're, where they are allowed to be. It's kind of like a ladder, but rather than even rungs, it's all um, sorts of wacky uh, gaps between the rungs and every atom's ladder is different. So the name that often gets associated with this initial understanding instead of Wollaston is Joseph Fraunhofer. So Fraunhofer, rather than using just a prism and kind of close observation, he really did create the first astronomical spectroscope. So um, he looked with his spectroscope at um, the flames of different elements to see these bright line emission spectra. And then when he looked at the sun, he saw hundreds of these missing dark absorption lines. So when we look at high quality um, spectra of the sun, and this is not from the 1800s, um, this is from more recently. And to think about this particular picture we're looking at, we kind of want to read it like a book. The wavelengths are going from left to right um, across each line. And we can definitely see by eye that some of these dark points are much um, wider across and much deeper. And some of them you can barely tell are even there. And if you had access to um, the full resolution picture, you could probably zoom in and see ones that you wouldn't be able to see just from this, um, this single slide. So the darkest ones are the ones that Wollaston had seen and that Fraunhofer had added names to. And the idea is, is we wanted to be able to figure out by looking at the flames of elements that were available in the lab, we wanted to figure out what matching patterns we had. So Fraunhofer right away noticed that the D line, um, which is a doublet and the letters had originally come from Wollaston, but Fraunhofer's now associated with them. That matched very clearly a bright line for sodium. If we have ever thought about um, the sodium street lamps that we have um, all over, that weird yellowish um, orange glow is because their primary and brightest um, emission line is in that yellow orange range listed D here on the, um, on the chart. This is a postage stamp even to um, celebrate this discovery. So we've got the start of this process of matching up known things to the sun's atmosphere to learn what the sun is made from. And Fraunhofer didn't stop with the sun. He used his new spectroscope on other objects as well. He looked at the um, light coming from the moon and was probably a little disappointed or maybe relieved to notice that it was the same um, spectrum. The moon doesn't have an atmosphere that can create much of any change to the spectral lines. It's just acting as a big space mirror and is giving us sunlight again. Same thing with Mars and Venus for the quality of the instruments that he had, Fraunhofer would not have been able to see any possible changes due to Mars's weak atmosphere or Venus's thick atmosphere, but he did see the same spectrum coming from them because what he was seeing was reflected sunlight. And he went on to look at other stars, and all of the stars that he looked at had a very similar set of lines. 
certainly well beyond the 1800s, we can start to talk about um, the, the naming of things and uh, deciding that we could identify these different spectral types. Uh, but for now, we're focusing just on the sun. Um, and so he just identified, hey, the sun is actually no different than these distant tiny points of light in our sky in that regard. When we do think about these spectral types, uh, as we are probably many of us familiar with, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, uh, total nonsense in terms of alphabetical order, but they come from a very um, important history of the um, Harvard computers. Um, and so when you look at these stacked here from um, highest temperature stars down to lowest temperature stars, we see that some of the lines are clearly more prominent for a range of these and almost seem to disappear for the other half. And that's true not just for always being the high star hot stars having more prominent lines. There are certainly lines that are only prominent with the K and M stars as well. So we move on a little bit to the mid 1800s. In 1859, Gustav Kirchhoff had set up an experiment that allowed him to directly compare the dark line absorption spectrum from the sun with the bright line emission spectrum from known elements. So it kind of looked like this where um, in a quite elaborate kind of way, using um, the newly improved burner from Robert Bunsen um, to burn specific known elements, that was shown into one side and sunlight was um, shown into the other. And then you can directly compare which ones are matching up. So moving, just, moving beyond just the knowledge that we have this sodium D doublet in the yellow, we're able to start to identify far more of these elements and recognize what elements are present in the sun. In his publication, Kirchhoff noted that Fraunhofer's lines exist in consequence of the presence in the incandescent atmosphere of the sun of those substances which in the spectrum of a flame produce bright lines at the same place. So very fancy way of saying that he is seeing the dark lines from the sun match up with the bright lines from burned elements. So he identified sodium and iron and calcium and all sorts of other elements that were also found on earth. And so we're starting to see uh, that the sun, although it's big and bright, by the 1800s, we're now starting to identify that it's made of all the same stuff on Earth. So at this point, there is a lot that we know about um, the sun from these, initial, um, from these initial experiments. So this slide here in the upper left, uh, there are a couple of examples of what we're trying to do when we're matching up patterns because each element has a finite number of lines that are prominent in the visible wavelengths, which is what everyone in the 1800s has available to work with. And it's worth noting that all of these are numbered by wavelength because as uh, Chris and I were talking about before we all got started, all of this work in the 1800s was done in black and white. Um, and so it really is a much more difficult task than we might think to be matching up um, these, these patterns and these specific uh, spectrum with known elements. Now of the num uh, labeled lettered, um, labeled Fraunhofer um, lines, the A through K, uh, a lot of them are from things that aren't uh, too surprising, either our atmosphere um, or hydrogen, and then a couple of things that we might not have guessed at first, um, calcium, sodium, and iron, uh, but things that are present in high enough quantity um, to create a much brighter line. And you can see here at the bottom those lettered um, lines indicated. So with the idea of figuring out what the sun is made of and what that spectrum looks like, this is also when astrophysics really um, took off. Um, in, in 
a lot of ways, and um, I say this in my um, classes too, astronomy is the oldest science. Astronomy of looking at the cycles of the stars and the sun and the moon. And we have ancient cultures that for as far back as we have records, we're keeping track of all of this. But it really is in the mid 1800s when we actually start to be able to build astrophysics as a separate and robust field of study as well. So Robert Bunsen um, had worked with Kirchhoff uh, a couple of years prior. He was a mentor to Sir Henry Enfield Roscoe, who went on to study all sorts of astronomical objects. And so we see um, in this uh, picture here on the right, it's hard to read the, the um, labels, but each of these is showing something specific. On the bottom, we have uh, elements. So this one is cyanide, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. Then right above here, uh, we are starting to get into astronomical objects. So this one, um, if I remember what it looks like, because I can't quite read it here, I think it's a nebula. Um, we start to get into um, different stars. This is Alpha Hercules, this is Sirius, um, and the top one here is the sun. And so there's this study of, okay, what is similar and what is different in all of these cases? And that's when astrophysics really um, got its roots. It is also true that there were plenty of other people, I can't name all of them, um, but uh, Angelo Secchi uh, built a catalog of over 4,000 stars using spectroscopic instruments that he um, developed. And so here we have from the top uh, the Sun, Sirius, Betelgeuse, and um, Alpha Hercules. So he's um, drawn here lines to help match up that there are similarities throughout all of these. Um, and it really does give you a sense of the quality of the observations that were available in the 1800s. So we think to ourselves, you know, now that we have um, this ability to look at something in the lab and compare it to the sun and other objects, maybe we've just figured it all out. That's certainly what Warren De La Rue thought in 1861. The physicist and the chemist have brought before us a means of analysis that if we were to go to the sun and to bring away some portion of it and analyze them in our laboratories, we could not examine them more accurately than we can by this new mode of spectrum analysis. All right, clearly there's nothing else to figure, about, figure out about the sun. We should just pack up and go home. Not quite. So with our 21st century knowledge, we know that first of all, there's quite a lot more to the sun than just the visible wavelengths. This image here is a composite of all of the different wavelengths that the um, Atmospheric Imaging Assembly on um, Solar Dynamics Observatory is able to look at all of the time. So SDO is um, constantly monitoring the sun and is used for a lot of space weather analysis. But each of these wavelengths shows us that there's different things going on with the sun. And when we look above the curve of the sun, we see all of these different um, structures that are not producing visible light in a way that we can identify here on Earth. All of these wavelengths um, that kind of look like they're extended past the disk of the sun, those are all in extreme ultraviolet, much shorter wavelengths than make it through Earth's atmosphere. So when in the 1800s, we are trying to study all of this stuff that is above the sun's atmosphere, the chromosphere and um, prominently the corona, we have to wait in many cases, for an eclipse, a solar eclipse. So this image here is from the 2017 eclipse, and it has been enhanced to show detail, but all of this detail does exist at all points, and when the moon helpfully covers up the very bright disk of the sun, we can see that fainter visible light um, that the sun is producing in the corona. So the remaining portion of what I want to cover is focused on the solar corona, which is also what all of my research in um, graduate school focused on. So in 1868, um, Pierre Janssen led an expedition to India to 
be in the right place for the August 18th solar eclipse. When they did that and they set up all of their equipment, his team discovered that there was a yellow-orange emission line that didn't correspond to anything known to um, labs on, on Earth. So we had done all of this matching up and now we knew what all of the elements that we had available, what they looked like when we burned them um, in a spectrograph. But this yellow-orange emission line didn't match any of those. And in the same year, but about a month later, J. Norman Lockyer had commissioned a spectroscope to be able to study the sun's corona without waiting for an eclipse. And so he also observed that same yellow-orange line um, in October of that year. Now, uh, in one of the biggest um, coincidences in, um, in science, Norman Lockyer presented his work on the same day that Janssen's results reached the French, French Academy. And so they are very much jointly um, associated with the discovery of this brand new uh, element. So what they called helium was the first element in our periodic table to have been discovered not on Earth. And they named it after the Greek word for the sun, Helios. And so now all of these scientists are hoping to be able to find other brand new um, elements to add to our uh, scientific understanding. And so William Harkness and Charles Augustus Young, they each independently observed an eclipse in the United States the year after, 1869, and they found a very bright green emission line. And because they were looking at the corona, they called it coronium. Now, as a reminder, when we are looking specifically at the corona, the very low density gas that's above um, the sun, um, the disk of the sun, the photosphere, we are looking at bright line emission spectrum. That's going to tell us about gases that are present that are already very excited and are being able to um, send off the photons as they drop back down to lower, lower states. When we look at the sun um, corona, there are prominent lines that, that show up here. And so we can see that yellowish uh, line that was labeled um, as helium. And then one of the bright green lines had never been seen in the, um, in the lab. All the other ones around here, um, the hydrogen lines, they were, they were seen by all of these scientists, but they were also already known. So the, the key was that we had found these new th things. Now, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, I do know about helium in the periodic table, but I've never heard of coronium. So in the 1896 book from C.A. Young on the sun, there's this quote here. As to the substance which produced the line, we have no knowledge as yet, though the name coronium has been provisionally assigned to it, and the recent probable identification of helium in terrestrial miner minerals gives strong hope that before long we may find coronium also. So as we end the 1800s, we have found helium on Earth as well. And so now we kind of can confirm that it is indeed its own, um, its own element. One of the reasons why it hadn't been uh, found in the lab is partly because it is somewhat rare to be able to find, and it's usually in gas form, but also because uh, it is a noble gas, and so it is hard to get a combustion reaction um, to be able to get its spectrum. Coronium, though, uh, is not on the periodic table, and it would be remiss of me to end my 1800s talk uh, without commenting on it. And so coronium, it took until 1939 for someone to figure out what was going on with it. A Swedish spectroscopist was able to identify that line not as a new element, but as an extremely highly ionized state of iron that hadn't really been identified or even thought to be possible to exist on the sun. That wrapped up the Corona mystery, but it created a whole new mystery. How is there a, uh, 
an ionization state of iron that requires millions of degrees to be able to exist when the surface of the sun itself is only 6,000 degrees. So I'm happy to talk about that in our Q&A, but that really can be a whole separate talk all on its own. So uh, I have my summary slide here, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments uh, that any of you have. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll kick that off. Also, is it not unusual because iron is a rather heavy element being in the corona of the sun? I it's mean, true. iron we associate with a pending um, nova, you know, because it's run out of hydrogen and helium and it's burning its way through the uh, periodic table. That is a very interesting result. Um, it's uh, it's all the pollution from those supernova. Ah, so yeah, the contamination of that. Okay. Exactly right. Wow. Okay. Bravissimo. From Thank you. Bravissimo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, so, my gosh, where do we start? Um, so your work on, so, oh, um, in studying the nearby stars, you talked about Sirius, um, Betelgeuse, and, and the others. What was the role, or where did they come across the fact that they, the observation that some of the absorption lines were shifted? What was kind of the scenario that set that up, and which led eventually to the, um, essentially to the discovery and the theory of red shift, as we now call it? Right. Um, I, I have to admit that in terms of the chronology of that discovery, um, I'm not quite sure when that was observable enough. Um, certainly those, those stars are close enough that I, I don't know if it would have been detectable at the low resolution of the 1800s. That might not be true, um, but it is certainly something that requires detailed enough um, spectra to be able to, to to notice that change. A combination of detail and with the source being distant enough to get right. a redshift that's measurable. Yeah, okay, okay. So they just simply didn't, with the resolution that they had and the, the star field that they were working with, it just wasn't, right. it didn't become. And the, the motion of stars towards us and away from us creates Doppler shift. And so there's that whole extra layer of being able able to figure out what amount of the offset is from the expansion of the universe idea, redshift, and what is just motion of stars both towards and away from us. Also, yes, isn't it true now that a lot of the identification of double stars is done via the spectroscopy in that they yeah, notice that, that is, the, again, but there's probably a precision problem because they would have to study the star over a period of time and notice this rhythmic shifting of the of the absorption lines and yeah that is that is one of the most common methods of studying binary stars mm -hmm. um certainly eclipsing binaries are fabulous when they're lined up properly but that's very rare for us and visual binaries, ones that are close enough that we can actually see both stars going around, those are also rare enough because they just need to be close. Um, so spectroscopic binaries are certainly the most common way to study them. And so radial velocity curves, all of that good stuff. But it's worth noting that you, you get an understanding of how fast they're going, but you have to have a sense of how that whole system is also oriented. So there's, there's a lot to go on um, to really figure things out, the masses of those two stars. Um, but it is something that is not too difficult to at least recognize if they're orbiting each other. And of course, and then, you know, not to, to jump from the 1800s, now we jump 200 years forward, um, is that amateur spectroscopy is becoming, that's, it's a thing now. We have uh, some former members and others that are 
trying, you know, contributing to the body of knowledge in this area. So it's also for those of you who have gotten bored with doing your astrophotography mm -hmm. or that spectroscopy is calling you and we can put you in touch with a former GRAAA member um, who is actively uh, pursuing uh, spectroscopy out in the skies of New Mexico. But uh, yeah, it's if you thought if you thought single if you thought single channel photometry was tough, try spectroscopy. <laughs> Calibration, yeah. Anyways, yep. science is king. Okay. Uh, yeah, Steve. Uh, oh, we have. Um, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, it's a great segue what? because Classified. here we are having a meeting on uh, Saturday, October third, and we're going to be talking about amateur spectroscopy and the equipment involved and so on and so forth. So uh, if anyone is interested to, to participate, it's going to be a Zoom meet. Just send yeah. me an email and I'll put you... Well, or Steve, if you want to send uh, send an email to me uh, or and I will arrange for it to be distributed to, uh, you know, as part of our distribution list, we can send it out to the world. I mean, that's the thing about these meetings is uh, sure we can share the wealth. Um, to answer John's question from the chat, um, so he asked if there were helium absorption lines on the sun, uh, and, and there are, and it comes down to, in the 1800s, it was an ongoing process, this whole forest of, um, of absorption lines were slowly being categorized, uh, and people just kind of assumed we would all be able to figure it out eventually, that, that one um, quote from the 1861. It was an ongoing process, but in emission lines for the eclipse, there's far fewer of them. And so they're more prominently, um, they're more prominent in whether we are able to identify them or not, just because, you know, there are five or six that are very prominent. And if we don't know one of those, that's a pretty big deal. But yeah, good question. Yeah, I've got a couple questions here that were directed um, that I have on just my chat screen. Um, one of one question that came from Mr. Farish, uh, Jim Farish, um, Dr. Wosley, will you come back and tell us how Hubble and Hummanson, Hummanson discovered the expansion of the universe? Is this I another? Would, yeah, I would happily be able to give a talk. We could we could talk about the distance ladder, all the different methods used for um, getting distances, and how they all kind of have to build on each other. That that's a fun talk. And the ongoing sure. mystery of why we can't seem to why different measurement methods can't agree on right. the constant itself. Right. Um, they're they're diverging instead of converging. Um, okay. Um, another question here was to. Um, Light passes through the prism. Does it speed up and slow down as it passes through white light? Yeah, so that's that's one of those things that um, it's always interesting to kind of have to reckon with because in, in my head, it's just like the light goes through the prism, it breaks up into all the different um, rainbows, uh, colors, but you do have to recognize um, as you noted, that in order for it to actually um, disperse, make all the different colors, when it goes from air to glass, uh, the speed of light does change based on, um, based on frequency. And so our idea of this speed of light um, being three times 10 to the eight meters per second or whatever units you'd like to use, that is specific to a vacuum and in different media, um, it, it is actually frequency based. So yes, they are changing speed in order to make our beautiful rainbow. Yeah, okay. So that it is in fact the, the, the change in speed that makes the rainbow, yeah. makes the spectrum yeah. possible. Yeah. Exactly. If you could line up another prism, oh, ooh. Now, once you've diverged and created a spectrum, mm -hmm. can you converge? Um, a spectrum. This is um, probably just one of those, you know, coffee cup discussions, you know, if you could yeah, travel it, half the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the short answer is, is not really um, to my knowledge in the sense that like if you've got the red light going through, um, it'll just kind of keep 
going through. But I mean, we've got convex lenses and concave lenses, and they're able to um, to focus light and unfocus light, certainly. Yeah, um, but we've got chromatic aberration, which um, I'm sure at least some of you uh, are yep. constantly dealing with. Um, that comes from the fact that if you think about a, um, a lens, it's really just two prisms. And so you are making this tiny little rainbow. And when you're trying to focus your image, you can kind of focus mostly the red and orange part of the rainbow or the green and blue part of the rainbow without an additional um, correction for um, refraction telescopes. But you cannot get you know, through a single set of prisms, you can't get the entire range in focus. You can, you have a preference. And right. that's where, you know, hey, if we could get uh, lines to come perfectly together, we would get rid of chromatic aberration in our telescopes. And we'd all have, you know, we'd all have <laughs> fun instead of seeing that purple haze around the, yeah. around the edge of the, uh, because it's the shortest wavelengths that become the most difficult. Um, because they're sacrificed at the expense of providing focus for all the other things. Good question though. <laughs> um, just turn it on its head. Is there any, oh, easy way to start spectroscopy? Um, well, I think Steve, when the uh, Albuquerque group uh, starts it on the weekend, actually there are, I understand, you know, I mean, just reading the marketing material, you know, caveat, um, that, you know, there are gratings that can provide the spectra and then combining that with an astronomical camera, one can collect um, spectroscopy um, images and then by sending that to software that is set up to be able to read those absorption lines, you know, one can work down the, the path. So I think, yeah, I think this October, did you say Steve on uh, October 3rd? That's correct. It'll be yeah. October third, uh, seven p.m. Mountain Mountain Daylight. Yeah. And uh, yes, it, this is like I said. This talk is a great segue into that one. So, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Happy to help. Uh, could I interject a comment here <clears throat> briefly? Um, it's good to see Steve Snyder with us. Uh, he was a stalwart in this organization way back in the '80s, I believe it was, wasn't it, Steve? That was when you had hair and I had red hair. That's true. I actually joined the group in 1977. 77, yes. And weren't you president for a while or you were at least one of the high uppity officers? I think you made me the uh, observatory maintenance chairperson. <laughs> see, that's your predecessor, uh, Chris. <laughs> ah. Good to see you, Steve. Okay. Good um, to see I had you. A Okay, um, Eric Van Zandt, did you have a question? I see um, a hand raised. Um, yeah, I did. Um, so really, I'm trying to get a perspective on <clears throat> these uh, scientists from this time frame um, and uh, their optics and what they used and the quality um, of the uh, observations that they were trying to do. Are they? Are they? How good are they at that time? That's a tough question to answer because there's, you know, different definitions of good. We, we saw the reproductions of their images. And so certainly you can tell the difference between lines. Um, so it's workable. Um, if you've got a specific um, criteria that, that you have in mind, I can try to speak on that. Uh, I well, certainly am, go ahead. So the telescopes of their time frame um, compared to um, say a hobbyist um, or um, somebody, you, you know, I, I'm trying to get a grasp of how they were seeing the sky compared to the way we see it nowadays. Right, so um, yeah, I'm trying to think back to my telescope history knowledge. Uh, so for example, William Herschel's 40 foot telescope, which was um, in the picture or in the background of that first picture we saw, um, that was a reflecting telescope, but um, not with, you know, a silvered mirror um, with a polished, um, polished metal. 
And he actually got really frustrated with it. It was not producing better quality um, images than the refracting telescopes that he had been using, which, you know, no matter, no matter how good your refracting telescope is, it is um, size limited to what kind of lens you can, you can shape. So in, in that time frame, um, for the most part, they are dealing with refracting telescopes and fairly significant chromatic aberration to my knowledge. Um, and probably would be consistent with a telescope that, that you could pick up in, you know, possibly a hobby shop without having to go into any kind of fancy. Um, so I'm better off with my eight inch top. Yes, yes, very box. much so. But, yep, okay. yeah, your Thank telescope you. in your backyard right now is better than theirs. Of course, the one advantage they had in the 1800s is a lack of street lights. Very true. The, you know, they did not have to deal with, matter of fact, the Harvard Observatory and those, they actually had their, some of their uh, scopes. Well, as we all know about Yerkes, you know, which is near us here in, in the Chicago area, that was, that was out West. That was out in the open sky country mm -hmm. of Illinois. So they, what they did not have in terms of equipment, in terms of what the quality of the equipment we have, we have, you know, but they did have the quality of skies. So um, that was a compensating factor for that. But in terms of, um, if you go through, if you, um, I just was watching again, this the thing about the glass universe, which was a story, um, Davis Sorbell did a, um, a history of the Harvard um, computers, spectroscopy yeah. and yeah, and the computers there. And there's a presentation online that shows some of the documents that they worked with where they had some of those spectra, you know, presented. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of go out there and search that. What they had, was they had a cracker, you know, they had a, you know, a top notch, the computers themselves, you know, who spent hours and hours laboring with, you know, with um, microscopes over glass plates and measuring all these things. Today, none of us would have the patience to do that. But that was but just- But we do have skills. computers, physical yes, computers, not and people. And yes, computers. and now we're, you know, <laughs> we're getting into, you know, right, we're, we're, we're creating those that can analyze, a, you know, a gigabit, gigabyte of, of uh, data pretty soon we'll be getting petabytes of data. So stand by. Um, we also had, oh, um, in case anyone didn't see this in the, the chat, um, Richard Bell is reminding everyone also. So we have Steve out in Albuquerque doing a presentation um, on October 3rd. In the November meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, KAS, uh, will be uh, spectroscopy will it be a topic on there. So, hey, Laura, you started a, you started a trend. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, and, oh, the, oh, there we go. And it's kasonline.org is the, uh, the website. Um, so I'm scrolling back up that. through the chat. And so I see a question from Mike Falk. Um, now that we can measure the lines beyond our Earth's atmosphere, does that change any of the observations? So, <clears throat> it doesn't change them as much as it adds to them. So uh, everything that was identified in the 1800s um, was pretty well figured out for the visible light wavelength that we were able to, um, able to use. And so being able to have spacecraft taking data where first of all, we don't have to worry about adding any new absorption lines from Earth's atmosphere. We get to have CRISPR uh, data um, that isn't kind of a mishmash of things coming from the stars and from Earth. So that improves things, um, but then also adds to all of the wavelengths that aren't visible to the human eye and the wavelengths that don't make it through Earth's atmosphere. So much more of a just improve our ability to do things rather than change any um, uh, conclusions that had been drawn. Okay. Uh, I also see a question from Emily Lynn to use laser uh, to use light in a laser cut is the frequency high. Um, so you mean like a laser cutter uh, tool, right? Um, I don't know enough about how those work. <laughs> yeah, laser burning. I don't know enough about how those work. Um, for the frequency, I think it would be more about the amplitude, just the amount that you have in a finite space. Um, because for example, there's red lasers and green lasers and that's a frequency difference um, visually. 
Um, but I think it's, it's probably more about how quickly it's able to um, cause photons to be emitted. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all about the power and it's how yeah. much power you can get into how tight, it's, and how tight a beam. And then right. yes, the frequencies are probably our optim, optimum frequencies for burning metal versus burning wood versus, you know, but yeah, there's a lot of, um, my gosh, I'm sure we can go to, you can go to YouTube and do laser, laser burning and be <laughs> treated to a, you know, a, a multitude of videos on, on that. Plus, if you've got a off-market um, astro uh, astronomical laser pointer, you know, you can, there's different <laughs> levels of power on those. There's some that you can, you know, you can pop a balloon with them. How about that for power? <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Okay, laser burning. Um, John's laser. got his hand up. Okay. Go oh, for it. You go for it. Oop. John, we're Ooh, not able a, to hear you. It's a little you. hard to hear you, yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, there we go. Oh, Ooh, I want that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking about how to make this topic accessible for, say, school age mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, you, do you have any thoughts on what would be the simplest test rig to demonstrate the concept of uh, absorption lines without requiring an investment in huge astronomical right. kit. Yeah. Um, so some of the things that come to mind, like to, to build up the um, topic, one of the things you, you'd like to be able to show is that white light makes all these different colors and does so based on, on temperature. So a, um, a light bulb that you can adjust. Um, that you can adjust and uh, have it show just the red and then into the red and yellow and then the full um, the full rainbow helps. Uh, one thing that we do in in one of the labs on campus is we just have um, filters so just like red green and blue filters and it helps build up the understanding for the for the audience that I think you have in mind. It helps build up the understanding that a red filter is going to let some of that light through the red and the yellow um, and it always kind of surprises um, students what it does let through versus not um, and then in terms of showing absorption lines themselves um, I would have to think a little bit more about a simple way to do that um, there's nothing that immediately comes to mind Thanks. As a little bit of a lead in <clears throat> to uh, that follow up program. Now, after this, we're going to have to have you for many follow up programs. But uh, certainly you'll be on our short list of, you know, <laughs> presenters. <laughs> well, uh, it was just a fine presentation. Uh, I did have a, a question in the chat room. I actually know the answer to this question, but it is a very intriguing subject. And, and a bit of a lead into what we were would talk about is the solar atmosphere and the corona and the reason why it was so surprising that the temperature there is so much higher than on the surface of the sun which at first blush would seem counterintuitive yeah so if if i understand the question um yeah why is it, it higher okay yeah so the question is why is it higher and mm -hmm. I spent five years trying to answer that. So, <laughs> so can you can just boil it down to 25 right. words or less? <laughs> yeah, I, I can certainly lay out the, the key points, right? So the sun makes all of its energy in its core, like the 20% of the volume in the innermost. Then all of those photons start to escape in all different directions. And as you get farther away from the energy source, the temperature goes down. So all that makes sense. If you're near a campfire and you walk away from it, the temperature goes down. And that's true all the way up to the photosphere. But from the photosphere um, out, there's this huge jump in temperature. And the most important starting point to this discussion is to take a step back and recognize that temperature as we tend to think about it as human beings 
is stuff feeling hot or feeling cold. But all that temperature really is, is a measurement of how fast atoms and molecules are moving. So in the room I'm in right now at 74 degrees, that's a measurement of how quickly all the different air molecules are just shaking around. And so when we talk about the temperature jumping to in the chromosphere 10,000 degrees and in the corona a million degrees, the question is not necessarily about how hot that is, but what is causing all of those different atoms and molecules to be able to speed up to what we are now calling temperatures, but it are really just things moving very quickly. Because in the corona, the density is so low that you aren't really getting collisions at all. So they're just, they're just speeding up and moving out. And our, our thought about something feeling a million degrees, like if we had a fire that was a million degrees, that's not really what the corona is, is like. Um, the, the earth is kind of sitting in the, sun, the sun's corona uh, and we don't really notice it that much. The density is just so low. So step one, temperature as we think about it, it's not really as extreme a problem as we might first think, but it is still a very open question. And the, the thing that causes it for sure has to do with magnetic fields. And if you've heard enough talks in astronomy, that's always the, the easy answer is like, well, what about magnetic fields? And just like shove it under the rug. But in terms of the two main mechanisms that can speed things up or give those atoms lots and lots of energy, uh, one of them is magnetic reconnection. So if we think about hearing of solar flares and um, coronal mass ejections, there is magnetic reconnection happening in those cases. It's basically two loops that if they're pointing in opposite directions, they can, I gotta get uh, for the camera. Um, if they um, are pointing in opposite directions, they can recombine and then all of a sudden they are in a different configuration. They go from high magnetic potential energy to low, releasing all that. That happens, but whether that fully explains the corona, still up for debate. And then the other possible main mechanism in a short uh, explanation is that magnetic fields are kind of moving around and they can actually have waves that move through them in a very similar way to um, the Great Lakes have waves and light itself is a wave. There are what's called alphane waves that are basically just as if you imagine the magnetic field as a jump rope just shaking up and down as they go along. And if you have waves, you can have turbulence. And then there's all sorts of complex physics that I can get into at a public talk level, but not in the time I think we have available. <laughs> well, you just, uh, you just uh, proved that I did not know the answer to that question. <laughs> but I think I'm closer to it now than when we started. Good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I had an awareness of that when the the uh, <clears throat> atmosphere, I mean, Betelgeuse has been studied and they've talked about it being so enormously large and <clears throat> hot, but the description that kind of drove the, your point about um, heat as a measure of activity, not as a measure of temperature in which we think, ooh, ouch, that's hot, yeah. is to describe Betelgeuse as a hot vacuum that's that's a good way to describe it i like going, that well wait a minute that's kind of a that's kind of a paradox yes it is because those atoms have nothing to run into so they're free to completely express their energy what is yep. their energy temperature so they're they're blasting around there it's not a very not a place you'd want to be it's like <laughs> you know but um but in fact, it's not that the temperature is, is misleading because again of our terrestrial yeah, mm -hmm. um, view of it, but it does exist. Okay, great. All right, so, all right. Well, so are you gonna go, is your follow-up then spectroscopy in the 1900s? <laughs> I feel like that's probably a longer talk as, as we get further into the future, there's a lot more complexity that shows up. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat>
right, I think There's, we got through. Uh, um, before you sign off, uh, I do have one more thing after Lauren is finished. I am. Is Lauren you're, finished? Yeah. You're finished. <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. It really was. Oh. There was, yeah, you see this next question about anymore. I do see this next question. Okay, yeah. go, go for it. Yeah, so I, um, the, the easy answer is not really, um, and that's because to define an element is the amount of protons it has, and those are countable things. So hydrogen has one proton, helium has two, and so on. And so the fact that we've identified all of the things all the way up to 100 and something at this point, um, means that we really have found all of the elements that can be present in nature. Everything above like 90 something, um, although they're often on the periodic table, they're man-made, um, they're human-made um, in the lab and they don't last for very long. So unfortunately, uh, with uh, sadness to the idea of helium and coronium and all these cool new discoveries, element-wise that won't be possible. Atoms are forever. Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind, folks. Yeah. Until we well, find out what. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to have been here. Thank you for. Um, if um, if uh, John and Jack are out there, um, assuming that maybe we will have this wonderful occasion to see each other in person next month. Give us just a little bit of a rundown on what um, Osiris Rex and incoming is all about, as listed in our program guide. Are you there, Jack? You want me to take it? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so uh, we have a new movie that is going to premiere when the planetarium opens called Incoming. And so that's a, uh, a really awesome uh, foldo movie with uh, – all about you know asteroids, meteors, comets, uh, what we learn from them and, and why scientists study them. And we have also been working on uh, our own production because every one of our shows also has a, uh, a live presentation where we do a deep dive. And so the deep dive for this uh, is Osiris Rex, which is uh, gonna be the first NASA uh, spacecraft to land on an asteroid collect a, a sample of the regolith on the surface and, and bring it back to the earth. So uh, uh, John has been putting a lot of time into doing some really, really cool stuff up on the dome for this. Uh, and so uh, if we can have you all in there, we would like to give you like a preview of that show and then also just do, uh, you know, kind of a uh, live sky portion with uh, uh, for uh, fall stargazing. One thing we'll definitely be doing in that presentation, if we can get into the dome, is to illustrate what Mars is going to be doing right about then. Mm -hmm. It'll be right in the middle of its retrograde loop. It'll be at near opposition, I think around the 12th or 13th of October. And that's when it will be brightest, arising at sunset. And because it's the closest planet to us other than Venus, it illustrates a very dramatic retrograde loop. And one of the cool things we'll do is illustrate that during the presentation. Yep. And then if for chance we can't do it in the planetarium, Jack and John have a fine presentation they've actually been doing about Mars, right? And we might be able to do an encore mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, yeah. So we've been also, the planetarium has been doing uh, live uh, virtual planetarium meetups. Um, so they post about that on our Facebook and also it's on our events calendar. It's uh, paid. Uh, I think it's like $2 for a member, so it's very cheap. And it's, it's a lot like uh, what we've been doing here. Uh, I'm not quite as uh, knowledgeable as Lauren and, and Chris. You guys did a, an amazing uh, show I really in, enjoyed it there's it was a great presentation and, and just a lot of interesting information uh, but we'll use worldwide telescope and so we'll do kind of like a uh, a planetarium show on your on your desktop or on your laptop and we'll show you what you can find in the sky uh, and uh, we've recently been talking about Mars 2020 so that's another robotic mission that uh, just took off uh, in July 
So an interesting program next month, even if we might have to improvise. <laughs> so either join yeah, us. Yeah, we'll, we'll have something fun for everyone. Online. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Chris. So we'll keep, yeah, we'll keep it in. Yeah. Keep it posted. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you, Jack. For those of you in the audience who did not know, Jack Teleski is the direct, planetarium director at the at the Grand Rapids Museum. Um, now, so and you've been in the position now a year. Almost you started a year, right? Yeah. 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 I, uh, I moved uh, in November. Yeah. Yeah. So we have high hopes for high expectations of Jack and his and his what team. What a what a year it's been. Yeah. What a roll, what a ride, you know. <laughs> okay. All right, folks. So we had approximately, in case anybody was watching, we had uh, about 32 participants at uh, one point. So very good turnout. Thank you. That's actually, that's about the volume of people that we have at our in-person um, meetings. So hopefully we can, uh, we'll at least continue with that or maybe even build from there. That would be nice. So uh, again, I advise you to come to our website, grAAA.org and stay in touch. We will continue to send out the email blasts uh, to keep you appraised of upcoming events. And I think uh, anyone that's online would, in, would uh, join me to hope that Lauren can come back and do another presentation at some point. It was very engaging. Thank you. I was going to ask questions, but I was so absorbed in the topics. It just kind of like took care of itself. Um, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. I guess we'll wrap it up. I guess, what do you do with a virtual meeting? You just pull the plug? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think yeah, we'll let you... We think let's all clap for Lauren. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This was this was a great uh, this was a good opportunity. And um, if anybody is um, interested in the slides themselves, um, you can email me. I'm putting it in the chat. Um, and if there's any astrophysics type questions that come up, um, always feel free to reach out. You object? Um, we can. Well. Um we've posted some of the resources to our, you know, website as, as educational uh, materials. Yeah, I can send you those. Um, yeah. So that would be, I think that's, and then that way other people can come into our website and, and pick them yeah. up as well if they aren't talking to you directly, Perfect. but um, just kind of creates an archive of those. So we can say, well, now Lauren, now last year you did this presentation and look at how, you know, <laughs> where's, where's the follow-up phase two? The sequel. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening and uh, be wishing you clear skies and, you know, astronomy is looking up. <laughs>